you for taking the time to be with us at C3. We hope you enjoy today's message. Like I said, it kind of does tie in today. So we are, we are in um, the book of Exodus. If you want to open there, we're going to be in chapter 12. We'll kind of wrap up chapter 12 today. Um, and, uh, and, and chapter 12 is, we're in the Passover, so we're kind of at the height of the story. Uh, but let me kind of get you caught up to speed real quick. So um, the book of Exodus is all about the journey. It's all about the, the exodus of the Israelites, the people of God, out of slavery in the land of Egypt. And uh, we're almost to that point. I, it's hard to believe. We're almost to, like, the good part. And uh, honestly, Exodus kind of takes a nosedive here pretty soon. But we'll see what Pastor Greg wants to do. Um, but we're, we're getting through the good stuff here. But so what happened is, is how did these people come to be in slavery? Well, this guy Joseph um, was done in by his brothers pretty dirty. And he ended up getting sold and taken to Egypt. And then a bunch of stuff happened. And he ended up going from a, a, a slave and a prisoner to the, the second in command. And God gave him a dream. And uh, he knew there was going to be a great famine. So he told him to... to um, to prepare all this stuff and get all this food ready, and they did. And, uh, and then when there was a famine in the, whole, in the whole part of the world, all his brothers came down, and his family ended up moving to Egypt. Well, then they grew up in Egypt, and it was like, started with like 70 people. And uh, over the course of, of about 400 years, they grew into this great, huge people group. And somewhere along the line, one of the pharaohs uh, 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 was not aware of this Joseph guy. So you can imagine coming to power and saying, why are all these people who are not like us living in our land... What, what's going on? And so, so, so they end up enslaved and they, they are forced into labor and all this stuff. And it's, and it's 400 years of, of slavery for the people of God. And, and finally, uh, when we get to Exodus, um, God calls Moses out and Moses starts out. Uh, the, 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 the Pharaoh is, is trying to kill all of, the, all of the male babies that are born. And his mother hides him in a basket and puts him in the, in the Nile River. And if you've read any children's books or seen The Prince of Egypt, you're very familiar with that imagery. Um, and, and he's actually found by one of Pharaoh's daughters and raised uh, as a prince of Egypt, hence the title for the movie, right? Um, and, and eventually he kind of comes to know who he is and, and he flees and he has an encounter with God at a burning bush and God reveals more of who he is, says that I'm the I am and, and I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and I'm your God and you're going to go back and you're going to, I've heard the cry of my people and you're going to go back and you're going you're gonna to bring them out of slavery. And so Moses comes back and um, there's, there's all of this kind of back and forth with Pharaoh and all this stuff, and Pharaoh kind of starts out laughing, I'm like, why would I let these people go? And, uh, and, then, and then it kind of is this, this face-off, and all the while, God is kind of revealing more of who he is, and he's kind of um, not only showing himself to Moses and the Israelites, but he's, but he's also revealing himself to the rest of the world. Up until this point, God's not really known outside of the people of Abraham. There's not really much understanding of, of this God of, of Abraham, this God of Isaac, this God of Jacob. I mean, now in the world, if you talk about the Christian God, most people in the world will un- understand who that is. They have kind of a basic idea that there is some Christian God somewhere, right? Back then, there was no. The Egyptians had their gods and everything else. And so God, God is kind of revealing himself, yes, to Israel, but also to the larger world. He's proving, he's showing that he is the God above all gods, that there's nobody else like him, that he's all all alone at the top. And so um, in, the, in the stubbornness of Pharaoh, uh, Moses says, let my people go. He says, no. Well, then God starts to kind of turn, turn things up, pick things up a few notches. We get all these plagues, right? And there's all these plagues come, and, um, and there's a plague of locusts and a plague of frogs uh, and, and, a, and a plague of blood. The Nile turns to blood and a plague of darkness and fire and hail and and all these, these horrendous calamities like, are, are, are all, all over Egypt, and they're um, kind of just, just beating against the people of Egypt as God's judging them and each of their gods um, and, and proving uh, who he is and showing who he is and showing that he's faithful to his people and that it's time to let them go. And, um, and so, so now we get to the height of the story, and, and, and each time that there's been a a plague or a, you know, an encounter with Moses and, and Pharaoh, uh, a few of the plagues were so intense, they were so bad that Pharaoh kind of relented a little bit and he said, okay, fine, I've had enough of you, your people, your God, you can take your men and you can go out and, and, and they, can, they can offer their sacrifices. And Moses is like, no, we're not just taking the men, we need like our women and children, like, you know, I mean, women and children first, no, no, it's not good enough. So he's like, well, fine, you can't go then. 
So then it's another plague. And then it's, and then it's not just the men. It's, well, now it's the men and the women and the children, but you have to leave all your animals. All your livestock has to stay behind. And that's not good enough. So then there's more plagues. And then finally we get to where we are now. And, uh, and we get to the Passover. And in the Passover, it's the most intense of all the plagues. It's also the most meaningful of all the plagues. Uh, and this is what, what Pastor Greg covered last week. Um, but in the Passover, God executes his last judgment against Egypt before the exodus, before the actual departure from Egypt to the promised land. But more importantly, he sets the stage in the Passover for ultimate and final redemption through, through Jesus. And so what happens is um, God talks to Moses and he says, there's going to be one last uh, final judgment against Pharaoh and against Egypt. And after this, it's going to be time to go. He said, this is going to be, this is going to be a big one. And so um, what's going to happen is, is every firstborn male from every generation alive in Egypt, whether it be livestock or cattle or, or, or people or like everything of every kind is going to be struck down. It's going to be killed. And for Israel, there will be a way to stay out of it because Israel is always protected from the, from the plagues. And so what they do is he says, he says you have to go and take a, a spotless lamb. And there's always requirements for what the lamb's supposed to be. And they, they slaughter it and they cook it and they eat it all and they put the blood of it on their doorposts. And there's so much significance in, uh, in, in every part of the Passover, from the blood on the doorpost to um, the branch that they use to um, the way they eat the meal. And uh, excuse me, I'm going to take a drink real quick. And they had to consume the entire meal. Um, Excuse me, there we go. Maybe. (laughs) I got a frog in my throat from one of the plagues. All right, still with me? Let's see how far we can go here. Um, so they had to eat the entire lamb, okay? Very important to eat the whole thing. And if their family was too small, they would share the lamb with another family next door. And so it was all to be consumed. And if there was anything left over, they were to burn it up. And so um, what happens is... Um, What happens is they, they, they do all this. Everybody does it. They're all faithful. They put the blood over. And in the middle of the night, here comes the Lord. And this angel of death, the destroyer, it says, is to pass over the Hebrew homes, every single one that has the blood over the doorpost. And it's this amazing event. You can go back and listen to Pastor Greg kind of un- unpack it. Um, <clears throat> but it's not just a one-time thing. It's, it's a moment. It's an event that will carry on, that they're supposed to celebrate every year. They, they begin to mark their calendars by it. Uh, they begin to celebrate this every year, and there are all sorts of different things that they're supposed to do uh, uh, in, in, in this Passover. The bread that they eat is unleavened. The, the, the lamb has to be spotless and young, and, and there's all these requirements, and they're each significant. And we don't have a lot of time to pack uh, each one today, but um, but go back last week and listen to it, uh, and, 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 and you could, I mean, we could spend, we could do a whole series probably on Passover. It's just fascinating. But more importantly is what it points to, and that's kind of what we're talking about today a little bit. Well, you open uh, your Bibles, Exodus chapter 12. Are you there? Yes, All right. Let's read this. So, so after, the fi- after the Passover happens... The angel of death comes and passes over all the Hebrew homes. None of them are touched. They're all fine. Um, but the Egyptians, all their firstborns are stricken. And so let's pick it up in verse 29. It says, At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. That's pretty intense. And Pharaoh rose up in the night. He and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks 
and your herds, as you have said, and be gone and bless me also. So Pharaoh is beaten. He has had enough. Every firstborn male in the kingdom has been killed. I mean, can you imagine waking up to just screams and cries and terror? Egypt is done. God's redeemed his people and it's time to leave. Verse 33, the Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste. You can imagine why. For they all said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, which was part of the requirement for Passover. Don't put leaven in your bread, which is uh, yeast, baking soda, baking powder, things to make the bread rise. Also makes it taste better. The people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. That's no small thing there. Make note of that. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 men on foot. <coughs> and that besides the women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much live, livestock, both flocks and herds. Guys. They baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. Okay, so there's a few things we need to note here about how they left, okay? Um, hopefully you heard all that. <laughs> so first, they left quickly, which I think is very interesting how fast they left, because this is a people who has been in slavery for 400 years. Moses has been doing his thing for, I don't know, several months at least. I mean, when you add up all the plagues and all the interactions and all the backs and forths, I mean, you're talking about a good chunk of time. And all the while, Moses is, 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 the goal is to say, let's leave Egypt. Let's be done. Let's get out of here, right? But when it finally comes time to leave, they've got to go fast. They don't have any time to let their bread rise. They bind up their kneading bowls and put them in their cloaks. So like, like the stuff that they use to make the bread, they're, they're, they're carrying with them in their cloaks. They had waited and waited and waited and waited, but when the moment came to leave, it came in an instant. You notice that? It's interesting. Centuries of heartache, slavery, hardship, suffering, and oppression, they were broken off in a moment. I mean, you don't even have time to get excited. It's time to go. You have the entire you know, country of Egypt telling you, get out. We are done with your people. Get out. You want silver or gold? Fine. Take it. Get out. Like you got to go. Second thing I think is interesting, it says um, that they left out of Egypt. I mean, 600,000 men and foot. Uh, you add women and children, a lot of estimates, over 2 million people. And listen to this in verse 39, that they had not prepared any provisions for themselves. What do they have? They got a bunch of unleavened bread. They got a bunch of milking cows and goats. That's pretty much it. You got over 2 million people. Dad, I'm hungry. Jeez. Oh, we used to take family vacations with eight people, six kids in the back. I'll tell you what, when we got hungry, it was bad. <laughs> Drive to Burger King, sack of burgers, throw them in the back. Good luck. They left without provisions. They had not prepared anything for the long journey ahead. The only thing they had was the unleavened cakes that they had. Remember the Passover meal? They had every single family had just slaughtered a whole lamb, right? Nice to take a little lamb chop with you on the road. You know, you go to a Renaissance Festival, you got a nice turkey leg, you know. People walk around turkey leg, they look pretty happy. They don't have that. You had to eat it all. Anything that was left had to be burned up. They don't have any provisions. This is going to be so important as they go, when they, the Lord starts to provide them food to eat. We'll see that as they go on with the man and everything else. But that's significant as well. Number three, and this is, this is kind of can be overlooked because, um, well, I'll just say what it is. So number three, they left their homes and their former lives behind. Now, you might think, okay, they were slaves. <laughs> what life, what home? But you got to think, these people lived here for 400 years. That's something like 11 generations in one place. 
Okay. Now, in Erie, there's sort of this like really cool thing about Erie where people have lived here for many generations, right? Three, four, five generations, sometimes longer. It's a place where people just kind of grew up and stayed and established their family. But then as some of the jobs moved out and other things, then, then a lot of people's kids have, have moved away. And that's no small thing to tear up your roots and leave, even if you're leaving for a better opportunity, a better job, right? Now, thank goodness, there's starting to be sort of some, some re-energizing, some, some new development, some things happening in Erie. Hopefully we'll see, um, you know, my kids, maybe we'll stick around, no, stay around with me, uh, won't leave. But, um, but, you know, even if you're leaving for a better opportunity, it's still, you're still grieving, you know, your roots, I was, I was born in, in Gainesville, Florida, and you know what? I left, we moved when I was four years old. I have a few memories of that place. I'll tell you what, though. Every time we drive there, and I get out of the car, and you just breathe the air, there's something very significant about, like, I was born here, and I sort of remember what that smells like, you know? I don't know if you've ever experienced that where you're from, but, I mean, yes, they're leaving slavery, but they're leaving their former lives behind. And number four, they did not leave empty-handed. Now, you might think a bunch of slaves, they're leaving in ratty clothes, not much possessions, no wealth. They're going to a new strange land that's kind of the, the promised land idea, the land that was promised to Abraham. They're going to go get it. And as, as, um, as slaves, you might think they don't have anything. Well, this is, this is so interesting. God tells them to ask the Egyptians for silver and gold and clothing. And they do. And the Egyptians let them have what they asked. And it says, thus they plundered the Egyptians. Isn't that funny? These slaves are leaving. Without lifting a sword, firing a bow, they plunder one of the biggest, most, most terrifying empires in the world at this time. That's amazing to me. Now, if we jump over the New Testament for a minute, um, that's kind of where we're going to go next. So uh, the, historically... For Israel, for the history of like God and his people, there's so much significance in this story, but there may not be any historical narrative in Scripture that is more important to God's plan of salvation through Jesus as this one. <coughs> so let's look at Jesus for a minute. Thousands of years later, well, about 1,500 years, 1,600 years, depending on how you date it, the people of Israel still celebrate the Passover just as Moses instructed them to. Thousands, because they still do it today. And it's during that time, during the Passover celebration, that Jesus is crucified. Now, twice the Apostle Paul, or Apostle John, I'm sorry, calls the Lamb of God, who calls Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You've heard that, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right? That happens twice. And his gospel is clear when it notes that Jesus is crucified the day of the preparation for the Passover. That day, the day of the preparation for the Passover, is the day that the lambs were being slaughtered for the Passover meal. That's significant as well. Paul is even more explicit in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 when he says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast. See, everything begun in the first Passover is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. But what's so amazing about God, what's so incredible about Jesus, is who provides the lamb in the Passover? Who brings the lamb in the, in the Exodus Passover to be sacrificed? The people do. Each family brings their own lamb. They sacrifice one of their own lambs to kind of have this sort of thing and slaughter the blood and God passes over and they're saved and they have this communion meal with God. It's amazing. But who sent Jesus to be the Passover lamb for all? Did you send Jesus? No. God sent Jesus. Who provided the Passover lamb in the New Testament? God did. God provides the Passover lamb to save us, to rescue us. He does it. And it's Jesus that offers rescue, deliverance, and salvation for all. It's through Jesus that we are taken out of slavery. We know that. Just as it's the Passover night, that moment that takes the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, it's Jesus that takes us out of slavery. 
You see, the way God rescued Israel from slavery in Egypt is still the same way that God, through Jesus, rescues us today. Without Christ, we are slaves to sin. We're hopeless, uncertain, lost, like sheep gone astray. But once we live our lives to Jesus, we're people with a good father, with a hope, with a future. Amen? We have a promised land to come. We're co-heirs with Christ and so much more. You can't read Paul for more than five minutes without feeling inspired with some of this. But there's a change that happens and, and, and has to happen when we leave slavery behind. We leave behind many, many things. In the Bible, Egypt, this is important to remember, is always representative of the world. Once you get past Exodus, Israel doesn't have many, not too many interactions with Egypt after this. Not too many, a few here and there. But they kind of move, uh, you know, a little bit further away. And there's a few political, military interactions, not too many. But when you get to the prophets, that Egypt comes up a lot, consistently. And it always represents kind of the world sort of those who are maybe enemies of God, those who are kind of the, the world's ways of doing things. And um, Paul kind of takes this, in the New Testament we talk about the, the flesh. You know, you have the, your, your, your spirit and your flesh, and they're waging war in the mind of man, and, 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 and we have to crucify our flesh with Christ, and we're baptized, it's kind of like saying, the old has gone and the new has come. So Egypt is representative of the world, it's selfishness. It's short-sighted oppression and all the things that seem good for a time but only lead to death. So in leaving Egypt and following God, Israel is leaving behind the old ways for a new life with God. And we're going to see that in the kind of the second half of of Exodus when um, God starts to give Moses the law. And then it gets into Leviticus. And part of that is is God setting apart Israel as a new nation, saying that, that you will be different from all the other people around you. And this is how. And this is how people will know that you are my people. And when God says it's time to go, you have to move quickly. See, the other thing is that leaven in the Passover meal, there's no leaven in their bread. They're not supposed to put any, they're actually supposed to take it out of the house. There's a few things in here about when you celebrate this next year and the year after that and the year after that, um, you know, you're, you're supposed to not eat leaven for a week, take it out of your house, all of these things. And it's, and it's so important that they do this because leaven represents sin. In the New Testament, Jesus says that, you know, be careful because as the, 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 the leaven, leaven's a whole loaf. So a little bit of sin gets in and it kind of can spread, right? So it's this sort of representation of sin. And so these things are left behind, even though they may have been a good, to, uh, good for a time. We know that what sin brings is only death. So here's my point. We're, we're going to tie all this together. Following Jesus will cost us. Following Jesus will cost us. And it won't just cost us once. It will likely cost us over and over and over again. Because what we're going to see is in the, at the height of this story, Israel's getting out. They're getting out of Egypt. And kind of this is the moment to kind of say, yes, finally, like they're free. They're going to the promised land and whatever. But if you guys, any of you know kind of the rest of the story, it's not like this isn't they lived happily ever after, is it? You got a lot of problems still. I mean, it's like not very long after this, they're going to take all that gold and silver that they plundered from Egypt, and they're going to melt it down and make their own idol. <laughs> That's funny. Like, what a waste of the blessing that, that they were given. But they're not done yet. They're not out of the woods yet. And it's the same thing with following Jesus. When you, when you say yes to Jesus, your life's not happily ever after forever. Or not ever, really. We could say not until forever, right? Anybody been following Jesus and never had a single problem in your life? That's not how it works, okay? That's not how it's supposed to work, and that's okay. That's okay. You know, I, I, I think about the hope that I kind of received this morning and just kind of feeling that well up inside me. It's like I look around at my circumstances, and there are a lot of things that, you know, I'd like to be different, but I still have hope in the midst of all that. That on some level, first of all, that it doesn't matter. On the second level, that it's going to be all right because I have Jesus and he's, and he's, and he's going to take care of all things and he's going to work things out and, 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 and eventually we'll be with him forever. But following Jesus will cost us. And Jesus says to count the cost of following him. 
Count the cost. Be aware that it won't be easy. But here's the thing. The blessings of God never fall short. Following Jesus isn't easy, but the blessings never fall short. Notice how the people simply asked the Egyptians for silver and gold, and it was given to them. They don't have anything. And God's taking them out, but he doesn't leave them empty-handed. See, listen, what you struggle through now will be rewarded to you later. The Israelites are struggling for 400 years in slavery. No wages, no pay, little food, not much clothing. But now, once the deliverance comes, they plunder the wealthiest country in the world just by asking. Isn't that amazing? God will not leave you empty-handed. What you struggle through now will be rewarded to you later. Jesus says it this way in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11. He says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. <laughs> Aren't you glad he doesn't stop there? When others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Everything around you is awful. People coming at you. Following Jesus is not always easy. Do you know why he's warning his followers that they will be persecuted? Not just because they follow him, not just because, you know, you're a Christian, so you're going to get persecuted, but it's because of what the followers of Jesus do. It's because of the difference that the followers of Jesus make. Followers of Jesus do what Jesus did. They break the rules in the name of loving other people. They have conversations with people they're not supposed to have conversations with, like the woman at the well. She was a, uh, there was a racial issue there. She was also a woman, not supposed to talk to them, not supposed to, not supposed to have conversations with them. Followers of Jesus give voices to those who don't have them. They stand up to governments that mistreat their people. The people of God stand up for inequalities. They stand up to oppression. They look out for those who can't look out for themselves. They welcome strangers. They share their belongings and take care of other people, regardless of where they come from. They forsake their own well-being for the sake of others. See, these things stand up to the status quo and upset the balance of power, and it causes the followers of Jesus to be persecuted. Jesus' followers were constantly hunted down. Jesus himself was hunted down. He's upsetting the status quo by breaking the rules in order to love people. You know, I keep thinking about, they, they, the Pharisees came to Jesus and they said, you know, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Ha! <laughs> You're not supposed to do any work on this special holy day. And healing somebody, that's work. Like, are you kidding me? What a ridiculous idea. It's, it's so much more important that we love other people the way God loves them than that we follow the rules all the time. Can I get an amen? But even so, even if you're, if you're persecuted in following Jesus, he says, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. You see, following God is not always convenient. It can be a wild ride sometimes. When God rescued Israel from Egypt, it was an event anticipated for generations generations in Egypt, God's coming. He's going to save us. Crying out, God, come save us. Come save us. We know we're not going to be slaves forever. We know you're faithful. Come save us. Generations of crying out to God, but it happened. The deliverance, the rescue, the exodus happened finally in a moment. The exodus, the leaving of Egypt is not well planned. It's not prepped for months in advance. This is an emergency, grab what you can and go kind of moment. Hurricane's coming, get out. <laughs> this is it. This is, this is, we got some unleavened bread. <laughs> Put 
put the kneading board under your cloak and let's go. We'll make it on the road. You know, riding a camel trying to make some bread. We'll cook it tonight. Like they don't even have time to let the bread rise. 600,000 men, something like over 2 million people, and they don't have any provisions prepared. You want to talk about faith? Moses, we, we need a couple days. We can't go yet. We need to make some food or something. No, you got to go. It's time to go. Remember, leaven in the Bible is a symbol of sin. Egypt is a symbol of the world. When it's time to leave the world behind with all of its sin that has entangled you, entrapped you, enslaved you, the things that have made you miserable, kept you in the dark for years and years, you better get going. You don't have time to make a loaf of bread. It's time to leave it behind. God's calling you out of it. The world is going to be judged. That will be taken care of. But right here, right now, God is offering Jesus to set you free. The time for your exodus has come. The time for you to leave behind whatever's enslaving you is here. All the shame, all the discouragement, all of the sadness and hardship, let Jesus break the chains. We sang it this morning, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. Let me tell you what, church, it's true. It's so true. I feel it deep in my bones. That's the hope I feel this morning. You know what? Take my burden, Lord. Yours, I'll take yours. Yours is easy. Yours is light. I can't carry what I'm carrying. And Jesus says, you know what? I got it. Give it to me. Oh, by the way, here's mine. It's really light. That exchange, oh, it's life. Carries me through so many things. Time and time again. Time and time again. Remember, it's God that provided the Passover lamb, Jesus, that saves us. He's saying to you this morning, get out. It's time to leave Egypt. There's a whole mess of stuff that you don't have to be part of anymore. You don't have to keep leaving living the way that you're living. You don't have to keep suffering the way that you're suffering. Jesus is standing with you, right next to you, offering hope. Leave that stuff behind. It's time to go to the promised land. I mean, can you picture these Israelites? Like, mom's trying to grab all this. Kids are trying to grab some stuff. Dad's like, let's go. It's time. Just leave it. Let's go. 400 years, it's time to go. How long have you been wrestling with what you're wrestling with? How long have you been enslaved and ensnared by the shame that's holding you back? Hmm. 400 years is a long time. 400 days, 400 months. God sends the Passover lamb that says, you know what? This judgment will not befall you. This death will no longer ensnare you. And in the process of saving your soul, saving your life, I'm going to take you out of slavery and bring you into a promised land. What a gift. What a gift. Jesus says it this way, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's, it's yours for the taking, for the receiving, but it's time to go, and it's time to go now. Leave it behind and know that you won't be left empty-handed because the riches in Christ far exceed anything that this world has to offer. Amen? Amen? Let's stand. God, we thank you today. Oh, we thank you for Jesus. What a gift you have given. What a gift you've given to, to, to take us undeserving, nothing to offer, but to say, you know what? Before you loved me, I loved you. That while you were 
enemies of God, I sent my son to die for you. God, we thank you for that. That there's nothing that we could have done to, to, to deserve it, to achieve it. But all we can do, Father, is to respond. But Lord, this morning I pray that you'd move on hearts, that your Holy Spirit would come and touch us as only you can. And I'm just going to say right now that if, if, if you feel a tug, if you feel a warmth in your heart, if you feel just kind of that itch, that's, that's the Holy Spirit saying, just let me take the burden off. So for you, if that's responding is, is to say, I want to follow Jesus, I want this life, then just yield to that and say, Jesus, I want to follow you. I believe in you, I trust in you, and I'm going to follow you. And if there's a shame or a whatever, whatever is enslaving you, I'd encourage you, just open your hands, just kind of in a posture of sort of receiving as the Israelites received the blessings of God as they were leaving, just open your hands and open your heart. And God, I pray that you would fill every heart, fill every hand today. You know what we need. You know what your people need. Only you do the saving. Only you do the delivering. Only you make it happen. Bring hope today, God, I pray. Bring hope today to your people, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, you are the Lamb of God. You take away the sin of the world. We trust you. We follow you. Father, I pray that you would bind up broken hearts, that you would come, and where there is hurt, that you would bring hope. Where there is pain and suffering, Lord, you would bring healing. Touch every part of us this morning. If there's sickness in here, Lord, I pray that you would heal it. If there's doubt in here, Father, I pray that you would bring hope and faith and security and peace. We turn to you, Lord. You're the only one that can do it. And Father, I know that you sustain us. And even as, as we're going to see that the people of Israel walked out in uncertainty and in faith, Lord, you never gave up on them. With no provisions, Father, you provided manna to eat. You provided water to drink. You did everything that they needed to, to survive. And you do the same for us today, Lord. We trust you. We follow you. We acknowledge you. And we thank you, God. We're so grateful. So if the Lord's moving on you, just whisper thank you. Just tell him thank you. Just respond to that for a moment. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you've done. And Father, as we go, I pray that you would Give safety on the roads. Let community be built up. Give us hope. Give us strength for the week. And bring us back together next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.